So today we're going to continue talking about the fields effect and how you are God's field to be planted and developed as a leader wherever you are on your journey. We're realizing that we are on a journey. We're realizing that we have more ownership to take about our own development that would be beneficial in this hour. And we spend some time talking about how we are a field to be planted. We've given attention to the kind of preparation of a field. So if you are a farmer, I'm sure you have many pictures in your mind about how you prepare a field. If you've ever driven a tractor, if you've ever um, you maybe weeded a garden, if you've ever watched something grow, your mind immediately goes to many of the natural laws of God's order that are at play, even as we begin to think about the development of our own lives as a field. We know from the scripture that there's even a reference uh, to us as a field. And so with that in mind, we're going to go today to the second aspect of this, because after a planting, over time, there is a cultivation process that occurs. And today we want to talk about how to cultivate our field, and that's where we are. So let's jump in and right off the bat realize that the growth of leadership is not something that just happens to us, but rather a process we are to own and cultivate. And that's, that's uh, our jumping off point. This requires some action. It requires participation. It requires partnership with God and others to cultivate our field. Why? This action is what will promote growth. When you plant a garden, when you plant a crop, you're going to water it. You're going to pray for sunshine. You're going to pray for rain and seasons. You're going to do the things that will promote growth. And there are things in your life you can do as well to promote your own growth. We can align certain resources. We can simply make the mental realization or take the mental Position that learning is not a passive exercise, but it's instead an active one. And so it's my desire today that the things you hear will help you set yourself up for success. How many of you have ever done less than what you had hoped in a course or a development plan? Or we've all been there. It's something we wish we would have mastered along the way. And in hindsight, we think, well, if I had taken... A few more notes, if I had read the textbook, maybe, if I'd attended all the lectures, uh, I would have learned more. I would have carried more away. And I've always been a little bit puzzled as I've been on my journey with the Lord and just realizing what a personal invitation it is to partner with God in his development of my life. I have volumes of journals where I've noted prayers and answers to prayers, where I've recorded key scriptures or key messages or prophetic uh, leadings where God would be inviting me into something. In fact, one of my favorite things to do is work with leaders in learning how to steward all that type of data well because uh, the tragedy to me is watching someone be awakened to a dream or a calling and never stepping into it fully or never understanding it's something that would unfold over the years, perhaps even the decades. Therefore, five, ten years in, they're devastated, thinking they made it all up, and instead, they really left an invitation on the table for development because nobody told them how to cultivate their field. So there's action required that you can do to promote your own growth. It's to encourage your learning, and it's to foster your development. A few practical things you can do along this line of taking a more active role in your development is to align your resources. We talked just a little in the last teaching about aligning your finances, but there are resources to be aligned. There are books to buy. There are uh, perhaps professional societies to join or spiritual development communities to align with. I, I watch uh, sometimes as people go from conference to conference to conference thinking they're going to get the next big thing that will solve their problem or 
put their life on track. And although there are great things that come in each conference, the fallacy in this expectation is that it's something someone else or some angel or some word of the Lord will do for you when you've already got the invitation in your heart. And what remains would be the actions you take to literally step into your development in a more intentional way and in a more professional way. Now, if you are a lawyer, you have gone to school, you have studied, you have taken the bar, and you take continuing education to keep up to date on the law and on your particular type of um, specialization. If you're a doctor, you've done those things in your field. If you are a trainer, you may have gone through train the trainer programs, you have gone through educational programs, perhaps become trained as an instructional designer. If you're an artist, you've learned to paint, you may have studied under a mentor. And so <clears throat> when we think about our field that we're developing, we just naturally know there are steps I'm going to need to take. However, when we begin to think about our spiritual destiny and our calling, we often don't translate that same type of commitment in our growth. And we come into this uh, bit of a flighty kind of thinking, which is, I'll just get the next conference, just get the next word, I'll just get delivered, or I'll just get prophesied over. All those things are good. I'm not saying don't do that. But I'm saying to do those things and to leave your intentional development out is an incomplete approach. And you'll find yourself cycling into the same pattern over and over and over. And it's a tragedy to me to watch men and women whose hopes have been dashed because they just have not known this. Nobody told them. And it's my heart to equip you to align your resources, encourage you to associate with other learners such as we're doing today in this training together, and then go to, uh, a little deeper on the heart level and check your motivation. There, there's some tricky things that can happen here. Sometimes we want to step into someone else's calling <laughs> because maybe it's what's been promoted or what we've seen held up. And, and there may be similarities in that um, that, that are, are valid. But you know what? You want to be the best you that you can possibly be. I, I look at the people in the room and I think about the people watching this online or in our ministry kit audience uh, with ministry today. And I, I love the fact that this is reaching people who are leading mega churches and mega ministries, that it's reaching people who run coffee shops, it's reaching homeschooling moms, it's reaching health practitioners, it's reaching uh, people who are going to work every day at their business, at their 9 to 5 job or 6 to 7 job, right? 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. might be more like it. People who are working around the clock who do not know the serious call of destiny on their lives right where they are watch far too many professionals think and pursue the idea that the only valid ministry calling is if you're considered part of the clergy or part of a full-time missions movement. And we want all the full-time clergy and all those in the mission movement who are called to be there to be right there. But that's not the question for each of us is not how fast can I get into full-time clergy. The question is, what has God called me to do? Where is it? And how can I do that more fully and more efficiently and in a more anointed way? We've got these crazy ideas we've adapted in our Western mindset that tell us that the day-to-day -day work doesn't count and that our only real way to contribute to ministry is to write a big check to the church or to the nonprofit. And those are good things too. But when we take the attitude that that's our only valid way to contribute, you know what happens? We leave our own ministry undone Monday through Friday all day long. We don't realize God's been bringing people by our office at noon and at 10 and at 4 who just needed a little touch of God. They just needed to see somebody who would look them in the eye 
and see below the surface to their pain. They just needed to have somebody extend a word of kindness. They needed perhaps somebody to call them up for what they've done well and begin to mentor them and encourage them. And you see, part of our problem in our world today is that we have men and women asleep on their post in every sphere of society thinking they don't have a valid calling or a way to make a difference where they are. And so as I'm talking to people who work at City Hall, in airlines, in music industry, in health industry, and all the rest and in between, what a beautiful thing would it be if each and every one of us went full out in our calling, showed up for work after having gotten up early and prayed over our workplace, prayed over our projects, asked God how he wants to work day, bless the leadership of the con company, pray for all the people you're having trouble with, ask God how you can show up contributing and bring the joy of the Lord and bring the light of the Lord where you are. Do you realize it would be just, have you ever been in a room where there's a, a dimmer switch on the light? And what this would be like as this army of people get this message would be like the lights just being turned all the way up in all of the earth, in all spheres of society. I, I used to have a boss who I said, uh, he was the president of the college, and he goes, Linda, you can't train the whole world. And he'd kind of say it tongue in cheek because I always had a, another grand big idea. And, and one day I said, Dr. Grable, why not? You know, why not? And we did have people from all over the world enter our doors and be touched in one way or another. Now, some of us think that it has to be weird and uh, odd if you're a Christian influence. And some people do it so poorly that it's given us a distaste for it. They've used work time to do all their online Bible studies, thinking that was marketplace ministry. I don't think so. <laughs> they never did their work. They didn't do it well. They didn't show up. They didn't deliver. We ought to be doing the best work on the planet as Christians. We ought to be having our reports in on time. We ought to be the best customer service people in the building. We ought to be the ones showing up, engaging other team members, and uh, getting progress uh, on its way like none other. And the way you do that, I will tell you, is the most effective context there is for marketplace ministry. If you show up like that, they'll want to go do a Bible study with you after hours, or they'll want to come visit your church or find out how to get more of what you have. So it's not beating them over the head with our message and our Bible and our pamphlets and squandering our work time on things that we consider holy. I, I've heard tragic stories of people who work in organizations where leaders don't treat their employees well at all, and all they can talk about is their next mission trip. And that grieves me because the mission trip that individual takes to go to the other side of the earth and do something grand and yet come home to a hollow witness at work is a tragedy to the name of Christ. It is uh, an odd, odd, evil pendulum swing that occurs in the earth uh, time and time again. So where are the leaders that go to church that pray for their employees and their teams? Where are the leaders who are going to the other side of the earth to do these great things, but when they come home, they carry that same kind of passion for the teams they're developing and for the employees that they're building? Now, there's a saying that says, you'll never be more in public than you are in private. Uh, we can apply that to our homes. You know, we can't be all that at work when we're not treating our family members well and we aren't honoring them. And so, you know, the person you are when no one's looking, that's the person God sees. And we want a consistency so that the way we're living our lives, the way we speak, the words we choose, the way we honor God when nobody sees, when nobody's looking, is the very same person that they see when the hot shot walks by your desk and all of a sudden you're just doing things all different because the big boss is coming through. It's not a consistent testimony. So when we talk about becoming secure in your identity, these are the kinds of things that get addressed. And these are the kinds of things that foster our development. So we want to cultivate our field. We want to work on our field of leadership development. And I'm going to ask you to think about taking on a project to develop what I call your leadership portfolio. 
you may have some type of a development plan if you work in an organization where people have a job description for you and you've been in that job and there's certain things you know and there are certain things you're going to learn. That's customary. If you don't have it, you ought to get it in place if you work in a company or for somebody else. But you don't have to wait on that. You should develop your own leadership portfolio that says, here are the kinds of skills I'm great at. Here are the ones I need to develop. Um, there are several great ass assessments out there. One I recommend regularly is called Strengths Finder because it will give you your top five key strengths and it will give you a report for how you will flourish best in those strengths. But you need to get a few tools under your belt where you can speak intelligently about what you bring to the table. The um, resume you have probably needs to be updated if you have one. Everyone should keep an updated resume consistently, not just when you're looking for a job change. Why? You will forget some of the things that you have done if you don't document them. So keep a file and uh, now you have to honor company confidentiality obviously so don't, you're not going to put everything in your file but you can put a generic description of what you've done. And this is something every professional should work on just like keeping a running tab of the things you're accomplishing. You want to keep records of your learning, your certificates, and your documentation all together. You want to enrich your leadership experience along the way in some very practical ways. When you work on a project, this could apply to something in the community where you're volunteering, something you're doing in your church, uh, could it apply to your actual paid job. But whatever you're doing, let me just ask you, do you write thank you notes to the people that you've worked with? Okay. Do you know what this is? This is a piece of paper. This is a card. <laughs> it requires a pen, <laughs> and it requires a personal note. And we've gone to so many little emails here, there, and yawn, and texts, and those are all great. Uh, you know, we do a lot of things on Facebook, and so there's many modes of communication. But I'll just say that when you take the time to write an individual thank you note, and mail it to the people who have worked on the team with you and acknowledge them personally, that goes a very long way. Uh, these are the kinds of things you want to do with a genuine heart and the kinds of things that will enrich your leadership experience as you go. Have you ever had someone call you up for a reference and you haven't heard from them in five years and now they want to be a reference? <laughs> That's okay. Sometimes that just happens. <clears throat> but what could happen if you kept up the relationship in between? What if you checked in with them? You can only have so many people you keep up with. I mean, it's, it's true. But choose three, four, five key leaders you're working with across your life and stay in touch with them and let them know what you're doing and invite them into it. So thank you notes are a great idea. So now let's move on to some practical ways to grow your leadership. Uh, mentorship is one. And I uh, personally am a proponent of organic mentorship. There are formal mentoring programs you can enter into, but the best way to do this that I've seen is to volunteer to help someone in something they're doing. And when you do that, you get to right up next to them. You get to see them warts and all. You get to help them work through pressure points. You get to see how they made decisions, and you get to learn right along with them. And this can happen in a work setting. It can happen in a community setting or a church setting. People will volunteer if they can get next to the inside story of someone that they respect. And so this honestly is an incredible uh, way to grow and learn. Serving, working, formal education is, is uh, not to be underestimated. What about reading, applying, and asking meaningful questions? Uh, had some interesting dialogue lately with some young millennials and uh, we're talking about books they're reading and they want to know how this relates to their development and how this relates to um, the transformation they want to bring in society. So there's lots of ways to do that, but if you're not asking questions, you're probably not applying things on a very deep level. Learning always begs questions, and uh, that ensues a meaningful dialogue. So these are all healthy things to do that will help you grow your leadership in a practical way. Now let me tell you some things to protect against. Protect against bad seed. Every garden, every farm field can get weeds dropped in, right? 
uh, they just encroach and they begin to take uh, nutrients from the soil that are needed by the good seed and they can crowd out a harvest. Uh, we know that there can even be disease that comes in to ravage a field. And so you want to reject bad seed. You want to eradicate the weeds and you want to, I'll just say it, protect yourself against the varmints. <laughs> there will be uh, moles, there will be uh, various types of animals that will want to take a, a crop for itself. Now, those don't always are of evil origin. It's just how they operate. But what am I saying? You've got a crop to tend. And you've got a life to develop. And you've got leadership in you emerging to the next level. So you need to avoid negativity, and by that, you know, you can't get away from all of it, but don't put your precious leadership dreams in front of naysayers. That is very devastating and can cause you a lot of uh, rework in times of having to do damage control just in your own heart and mind. So avoid putting your leadership dreams in front of those who have a negative spirit, who have maybe an evil motive or a manipulative mindset. You know, the devil does come to steal, kill, and destroy. It's true. We like to think that's not something we have to even worry about, but we are in the world. We're not of the world. And so the way you carry your leadership development plan in your life needs to be as though you're guarding a precious treasure because you are. You don't need to subject yourself to uh, the wiles of an evil leader unless it's just some season you have found yourself in and you're, you've got your pen out and you're taking notes. Did you know you can learn as much from a bad leader as you can from a good leader? And so, uh, you know, when we think about leaders we don't want to be like, you just got a face or two in front of you and... Um, so what did you learn from that? That's the real question. It's not trying to justify it or say you shouldn't have been there. Don't get into that little side argument. Instead, say, so what would be the opposite of this? If this person was a know-it-all and I don't want to be like that, what am I going to be? Well, I'm going to be a lifelong learner. I'm going to entertain new information. If you have a leader who... Uh, never uh, saw your skills or invited them in or developed you, you know, that can be a big wound. Uh, and we talked yesterday about what to do with our wounds, our dry bones. You know, there's ways to manage all of that. So what do you do with that? You say, well, in my leadership portfolio, I want to make sure I see the people around the table. I want to make sure I know their skills. I want to know what makes them tick. I'm going to have some one-on-one -on -one development with them. I, I used to take my staff and find out everybody's favorite candy bar, you know, and then what I would love to do is just leave it on their desk at certain times when they had really done something awesome in a meeting or a project or delivered. And so, you know, these are real people coming to the table. They have lives, they have families, they have hearts, dreams, and desires. They have a favorite candy bar. And so to be able to see them, uh, if you've been in a situ work situation where you did not get much development at all, just flip that coin and say, so what do I want to do with this? And this is part of what you put in your leadership portfolio. Pray protection over your leadership development. And lastly on that, check your alignments. Um, you can give people too much power in your life. There may be some people you admire or you thought were this and you got involved and they weren't this, they were that but you want to keep sticking it out because you thought that's what you were supposed to do. And you can find yourself in some pretty awkward seasons. Again, nothing's lost, uh, but check your alignments. Uh, I, I heard somebody say the other day, I don't know that I need to subject my leadership development to someone else's learning curve. And I thought, now that's a very interesting statement. Uh, this individual was just trying to decide where they were going to focus most of their energy, and they, they saw some change coming, some handwriting on the wall. And I thought that was a, a very astute recognition that this person knew their leadership portfolio and what they had to offer. And seasons come and seasons go. And so uh, God helps us. There's timing involved. This, is, this has a lot of inputs to it. 
but uh, consider your leadership portfolio and your development and uh, don't subject yourself to the wrong leader at the wrong season. I'll leave it at that. So let's go to your mantle of leadership. I love to talk about this and I have a chapter on this and impact your sphere of influence that gives you a lot of great data to work with by taking mentors from the Bible. You know, people who tell me I never had a leader take me under their wing, nobody ever really groomed me for success or taught me leadership. And you can find leaders that you may not even know personally that you can actually take on as a mentor. You can find someone that's an author that writes things that encourage you and just learn from their blog. You want some people in person too, but don't think that if you don't have the in-person coach in your life yet that you are without a teacher. The thing that I like to encourage to do people to do when developing what I call your mantle of leadership, and this is taken from the, a study of, an, of Elijah and Elisha. And so if you've read that story, you'll remember that Elisha was plowing in the field, doing his day job, had the plow out, doing probably what was not his favorite work in the hot sun and plowing the ground. And it had been communicated by God to Elijah that he was to anoint Elisha as his replacement. And Elisha comes by and throws a cloak over him, or what the Bible calls a mantle over him. And from this point, that was his call to be trained under the mentorship of Elijah. And he came out of his day job and went into this season of very intense leadership training. And so I would uh, they probably didn't call it a KSA inventory, knowledge, skills, and abilities inventory. But I will bet you this, Elijah looked at Elisha. He said, here's a man who can plow. Here's a man for, with a heart to learn. Here's a man to be used by God. So he has these 10 skills, but he needs some training in hearing God. He needs some training in how to deliver a word. He needs some training in how to carry out a prophetic act, other things. And when you do an assessment of your own knowledge, skills, and abilities, you've got a great baseline to work from. You're not just wondering, am I there yet, or will I ever be there? You've got some data. Data is available. Information is power because it shows you where you are. There is Holy Spirit work that happens, but there's a part you need to assume responsibility for in your leadership portfolio that takes a professional look at your skill set. And then you want to develop a learning track to fill the gaps, and in companies you would call this a personal development plan. But at the end of the day, you need to get the help you need to learn what you don't know. Elisha learned what he didn't know as he worked with Elijah, and in the end of that story, or near the end of that story, we see a day that where Elijah, I love this part of the story, Ask Elisha, he said, what do, you, what do you want from me? I'm sure he was just an eager, adventuresome uh, learner from what I could read in the scripture, eager to do it all and go the distance. And at, at one point, his boss just asked him, you know, what do you want? What do you want from me? And I don't think he hesitated a second. And he said, I want a double portion of your anointing. I want everything you have times two. Now, if you were asked by your ideal mentor, what do you want from me, would you have an answer? I think most of us would, first of all, question even being able to answer the question, what should I ask for, how far should I go? But like if you've thought it through and you say, I want to be used to reach the world for X, Y, Z, I want to bring um, medical supplies to this country or that, or this population or that. I want to run an airline. I want to, what do you want to do? I want to rework the music industry. I want to, what is that thing in your heart that you might have thought? It's just too big. It's too audacious. You know, in Texas, we always say go big or go home. And uh, so, you know, this is not to overreach and grab for stuff that is so heady that you can't get your arms around it and it might seem contradictory to this logical approach we've been taking but I'm going to tell you God's a both and God both and God 
And there are ways in God's economy of thinking and or working with us, I'll say it that way, that call for the big audacious dream, call for the knowledge and skills assessment on paper, call for the time in the trenches with a mentor that all come together to cultivate our field for learning. When uh, this audacious statement was made by Elisha, we'll see several times, three more times after that, where Elijah said, look, I'm going to go over here to this city. You stay here. Every time this relentless, fiery Elisha says, no, I'm going with you. And then again, same story. Okay, I'm going over here to do this. Stay back here. Oh, I'm going with you. I mean, he would not be put back. Third time, same thing. And then the condition of his receiving the mantle, the full mantle, was that he would be with Elijah when he went up, and he was. And soon after that, we watch him walking in prophetic authority he had never displayed before. And there's a lesson there for all of us as we think about cultivating our field. We're anxious for the title many times. We're just kind of wired that way. We want the label. We want the business card. We want the nameplate. You know, you can have those things. But the real evidence of your walking and your authority will be revealed by your actions and what you do. I, I've watched so many people waiting for the title, just sitting on the sideline. And it is time for God's leaders in training to get off the sideline in motion confident in their vision and showing up full out I say or playing full out showing up to contribute and when Elisha had gone through leadership school had been a relentless lifelong learner had received the mantle the people around him recognized because of his new authority who he was he began to part the waters. He began to do mighty prophetic acts that he had not been able to do before. And when that happened, the people observing said, he has surely been with Elijah. And he's walking in the authority of Elijah. So what does that lesson mean for you and for me and for the developing leader? It means don't get too hung up on who's recognizing you. Rather, Engage deeply with God in your, in your plan and your development and begin to walk in it. And the evidence will speak for itself. The evidence will speak for itself. One of the reasons I like to work with our clients and participants to be able to speak their vision out loudly with confidence is that you watch an interesting thing happen in a person. They may read their vision kind of timidly at first. They're still getting comfortable with it. We have them read it again, maybe a little louder, and, and you'll just begin to watch changes in their physical uh, appearance. They start standing up a little straighter. They start holding their head up. They start speaking more loudly. They start speaking with confidence. You watch somebody do that, it falls off on the other people. Uh, we did some of that in a, a session not so long ago where a person continued to repeat their vision at my bidding. And as it got stronger, as it got louder, as the confidence came through, everybody wanted to be with them. Everybody wanted that too. See, the world's hungry for good leadership. There's too many people sitting around waiting on each other. And when those who are stepping into their leadership own their vision and can speak it with confidence they're surrounding themselves with others who are learning they've got their mantle they've got a plan they know where they're going they they'll find that this is true good leadership attracts like a magnet because people are hungry to be led people are looking for a leader who will step up with confidence who's going somewhere and that is very attractive so to sum this up, I'm asking you to sign up for leadership school. I'm asking you to take these thoughts, understand that God has training and schooling for you. I'm not referring necessarily to any one school. I'm saying this is a lifelong school of leadership for you. And as we take responsibility for our own training, we'll learn we're not going to hide behind the mistakes of our leaders who haven't done so well. But we're going to learn from those 
just as though we are learning from the best leaders we've ever had. And we're going to take a very intentional approach to establishing a leadership track to cultivate our field of leadership. A field planted is a field to be cultivated in expectation of a harvest.